morning. You can be seated. Welcome to spring break and global pandemic 2020. This is what it looks like. Uh, listen, we're glad that you're here this morning, and I don't know about you, maybe I'm the only one, but as, even as we just sang through the first couple of worship songs, I can't really help but think of these songs through the lens of what's taking place in our state, in our, in our country, and in our nation. And I think it's probably right that we view it in that way. Now, each morning over the last few weeks, we have been taking some time to pray, and pray specifically thinking towards Easter in about a month from now. And each Sunday morning, we've had a different leader, a community group leader come and lead us in prayer. We've opened up the altar at the front, giving you the opportunity to come and spend some time in prayer with prayer prompts that we will have on the screen behind me. And so this morning, uh, we're not going to have the senior adult uh, community group leaders and senior adults come to the front this morning. Um, we have encouraged and, and, and asked our senior adults to be very careful about uh, being in large groups and in close spaces. And so we're going to reschedule our senior adults being the, the leaders in our prayer time. 2022 sound about right? That'd be okay? Okay. But we're still going to open the altar this morning. If you feel led to come and to find a place to to get down before God and pray, I would ask that you pray as you see Scripture and as you see the, the prompts behind us here. Pray for our nation and pray for what's taking place and what we're going through. At this time, we're going to offer that opportunity and we encourage you to do that. In a little bit, I will come back and close this out in prayer. Let's go to him. Heavenly Father, in great times of joy, we give praise to you and we sing hallelujah to you because we understand that you are good and you love us and you know and want and will do what is best for us. God, in good, good days, we sing hallelujah to you. But God, it is our testimony in this place today that when things are difficult and when things are hard and confusing, when things are dark, that does not change who you are. And so, Heavenly Father, we give praise to you in the midst of difficult circumstances. And we sing hallelujah to you, God. We lift you up. We praise your name and we give glory to you. And nothing will change that, God. May we be faithful to you in our praise of you in the days ahead. It's in Jesus' name we pray. So I ran across this devotional in um, New Morning Mercies, Paul David Tripp. It's a great devotional book if you're looking for one. And Wednesday, this just happens to be March 11th, on Wednesday when everything seemed to kind of start crashing down on our heads, right? At the top of the page, it says, of course, you haven't been fulfilled in this world. It's a sign that you have been designed for a world to come. Here's the real life street level issue. If you don't keep your eyes focused on the paradise that is to come, you will try to turn this poor fallen world into the paradise it will never be. In the heart of every living person is a longing for paradise. The cry of a toddler when he or she falls down is a cry for paradise. The tears of the school-aged kid who's been rejected on the playground, tears of one reaching out for a paradise. The pain of aloneness that a person without friends or family feels in the pain is the pain of one longing for paradise. The hurt the couple feels as their marriage is struggling is a hurt of those crying out for paradise. The sadness that the old man feels as his body weakens, a cry for paradise. And on and on he goes and down towards the bottom he says, when you forget your work, 
When you forget this, you work very hard to try to turn this moment into paradise. Your marriage will not be paradise. Your job will not be paradise. Your friendships will not be the paradise your heart craves. The world around you will not function like paradise. Your children will not deliver paradise to you. Even your church will not live up to the standard of paradise. If you're God's child, paradise has been guaranteed to you, but it will not be right here, right now. All the things that disappoint you now are to remind you that this is not all there is and to cause you to long for the paradise that is to come. The dreams that die remind you this is not paradise. The flowers that wilt, this is not paradise. The sin that captivates you should remind you that this is not paradise. The disease that infects you, reminders, this is not paradise. Live in hope because paradise is surely to come. And stop asking this fallen world to be the paradise it will never be. That really struck me as I was uh, so sad about the things that were going on and as we try to make this world work, right? I thought it was so timely. I'd had to share it with you. Um, We've been singing songs all morning. I don't know if you've noticed that kind of center around the theme of perfect love driving out fear. Anybody honest enough to say that they've been struggling with fear? One person, two people. Okay, four. Anybody else? It's church. We're supposed to be honest. Thank you. Gosh, howdy. I'm struggling with it. So um, even just as we rehearsed this song today in rehearsal, I found that it ministered to me so much. So um, let's stand together. And um, as we stand, let's choose faith over fear. And I think that's something we're going to have to do moment by moment by moment. Let me invite you to take out your message notes from inside your bulletin. And uh, if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 12, Old Testament, uh, 1 Kings chapter 12. Before we jump in this morning, let me just mention a couple of things to you about uh, our response to, again, what's going on in the world around us uh, today and in the days ahead. Um, we sent out a letter this uh, week, actually yesterday, and letting everyone know that we were going to cancel community groups this morning. We did that. We are also going to... Com- going to cancel community groups next Sunday morning as well. We're already in spring break. We don't have Wednesday night activities. And I would just encourage you to sort of stay tuned and stay connected through our Facebook page, through our website, oakdlebc.com, as we share more information with you, any other decisions that need to be made. And we will keep you informed and, and make sure you know what's going on and what's happening. And in the meantime, do I have your commitment, those of you who are right here this morning, those of you who are watching online, do I have your commitment that you will be in prayer for us as a church and for the leadership of our church as we work through uh, these difficulties in the days ahead? I, I know that you will do that. I know you will pray, and we ask you and encourage you to do that. We are in week four of our series called Ways, Knowing and Doing the Will of God, where we have been using this idea of a crowdsourced navigational app like Waze as a comparison to our efforts to discover and to follow God's will for our life. A couple of weeks ago, I showed you three aspects of God's will, the providential will of God, the things that are going to happen no matter what, the moral will of God, the non-negotiable things that God has specifically instructed us to do. And then number three, the personal will of God, where we get some specific direction for our lives in terms of decisions that we have to make. Then last week, I, I said that the more familiar we are with God's providential and moral will, the easier it will be for us to discern his personal will. And the best way for us to do that is to become as knowledgeable as we can with God's Word and and with its principles that we can apply in our life. Now, would you agree with me that it makes sense 
that understanding the three aspects of God's will, studying the Bible, and learning biblical principles could have a big impact on our ability to discern how God wants us to live. But would you also agree with me that there are situations in our life where we don't have time for a 26-week study on the providential will of God, right? There are times where we have a decision to make, and we have to make it right now. And so we're going to talk about how to discover God's will when you have a deadline, and you need to know it right now. In 1 Kings chapter 12, we're going to read a story about a would-be king who stumbles onto a principle that shows us a very practical way of discerning God's will for our lives. Now, let me give you a little bit of a background here. The first king of Israel was a man named Saul. Uh, He didn't do so well, and so God replaced Saul with David. David did really well, at least for a while. And, and then David's son, Solomon, followed him as the king of Israel. So, so here's the deal. Solomon did okay, uh, especially at the beginning of his reign. But eventually, if you remember the story, Solomon turned his heart away from God and to his multiple wives, foreign gods. That's a mouthful for me to say. And trust me, it's a mouthful of a story, okay? He turned away to his multiple wives, foreign gods, And so God said to Solomon, because I have promised that I would keep the kingdom in your family, I'm going to let your son Rehoboam become king when you die. But because of what you've done, and because I'm God, and I honestly have a wicked sense of humor, okay, I am going to take part of the kingdom, and I'm going to give it to a man named Jeroboam. Now, of course, God couldn't have given it to a guy named Ed, right? He had to give part of the kingdom to Rehoboam, and he had to give the other part to Jeroboam. Tell me God does not have a sense of humor. Well, as you can imagine, Solomon was not too happy about this, and so he tried to chase down Jeroboam and kill him. Not a very godly thing to do, but Jeroboam was able to escape to Egypt. Well, enough time passed that when Solomon finally died, everybody just assumed that his son, Rehoboam, would be crowned as king of Israel. And this is where our story picks up in 1 Kings chapter 12, again, beginning with verse 1. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all the Israelites had gone there to make him king. So Rehoboam is about to become the king. When Jeroboam, son of Nabat, heard this, he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon, he returned from Egypt. So they sent for Jeroboam, and he and the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam, are you confused yet? And said to him, your father, Rehoboam, son of Solomon, your father, had put a, he put a heavy yoke on us. But now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us, the people said, and we will serve you. And so Rehoboam, again, Solomon's son, he now faces this defining moment in his life. The people have spoken and they have said, we want you to be king. Are we all on the same page here? Okay, Rehoboam, we want you to be king, but we want you to be a different kind of king than your father. And understand that, that part of all of this was, if you know anything about Solomon, he had incredible wealth, right? He, he built amazing things. People came from around the world to see the treasures and the, the, the incredible things Solomon had done. Well, guess what? It, like any politician, guess where all that wealth came from? It came from his people, okay? It came from the resources of the land. And so in order to have these incredible historical things that Solomon had, he put a heavy burden on his people. And that is what the the people now of Israel are responding to. Now, from our vantage point, we would look at this situation. Rehoboam, we want you to be king, different kind of king. Jeroboam, Jeroboam, you're kind of in in the wings over here. We would say this decision is easy for Rehoboam. Here's what you got to do, man. You got to lighten up, okay? Lighten up. And, and, and just become the king, right? That's, that's all you got to do. 
Remember that to this point in history, there had only been three kings of Israel, and they weren't exactly used to taking advice, much less orders from the people. So to say to the people, you know what, I'm going to lighten up, I'm going to be a merciful king, that might have been seen as him saying, I'll be a weak king. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you see how that might have been the case? And so if he gave in to this request, who knows, next week they may come back to him with another request. And before long, he could be held hostage by the requests of his people. Now, at the same time, he knew that his father Solomon had been very hard on the people. So there may have been something in him that wanted to give in to their requests, but there also may have been something in him where he wanted to prove a point. I'm not weak. So he was in a difficult position. He was a young man. He was inexperienced at leadership. He he was a guy who had a very hard decision to make, and he did not have the skill or the wisdom of his very famous father. He also did not have unlimited time, okay? These people weren't going to wait forever. So, to start this decision-making process off, he does something very, very smart. He asks for some time to figure it out. Did you know that that is an acceptable way to do things? Instead of making a bad decision, he asked for a little bit of time to figure it out. Look at verse 5. Rehoboam answered, Go away for three days and then come back to me. And so the people went away. And then he actually did the thing that all of us need to do when we've got to make a decision and we've got a deadline and we do not know what to do. Rehoboam went and asked for insight from wiser, more experienced people. And believe it or not, God spoke through these men. This is verse 6. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people, he asked. So he goes to the older men in the kingdom who have the vantage point of of having watched his father rule, having seen the mistakes that his father had made. They'd seen the consequences of those mistakes. They'd seen the good decisions that his father had made. They had unbelievable perspective for this particular situation. And in a nutshell, they gave him very, very wise and godly counsel. Verse 7, they replied, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. And you know what? If Rehoboam had taken that advice, he would have been a completely, this would have been a completely different story. Not only for him, but for the nation of Israel. But this, right here, this is the moment where he departed from good judgment. Look at what he says in verse 8. But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. Now let me just pause just for a second. Notice something. It doesn't say that he considered the elders' advice and then he considered his friend's advice, and then then he rejected the elders. Do you see that? Do you see the difference? It says first he rejected their advice outright. He said, no matter what happens, I'm not going to follow them. I'm not going to do that. Do you think that was a good idea? Do you think that was a good way to approach this very difficult situation? I don't. Verse 9, he asked them, the young men, what is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke your father put on us? The young men who had grown up with him replied, tell these people who have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Tell them, are you ready for this? This is, this is big time, you know, really cutting somebody down in ancient Israel. Tell them my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Boom, drop the mic and walk away. Okay? Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I have studied this verse. I have taught on this verse before. I literally have no idea what that means. Okay? 
Uh, I can't find what it means. No, I, nobody can figure out what it means. All that we know is that it, it, it's a figurative way of saying, if you think my father was bad, bubble, bubble, bu- baby, you ain't seen nothing yet. Right? I mean, that's what uh, we, we can tell that's what he's saying. All right. Verse 11. You like that? Okay. Verse 11. Say, my father laid on you a heavy yoke. A uh, heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. I mean, okay, come on, really? This is the advice these, these yahoos gave him? Verse 12, three days later, Jeroboam and all the people returned to Rehoboam, and, and the, as the king had said, come back to me in three days. And the king answered the people harshly, rejecting the advice given by the elders. He followed the advice of the young men and said, my father made your yoke heavy, I will make it even heavier. Okay, and then here is the most incredible part, verse 15. So the king did not listen to the people, for this turn of events was from the Lord to fulfill the word the Lord had spoken to Jeroboam, waiting in the wings. Now, on one hand, this is an unbelievable example of how the two parts of God's will blend together. And it's a reminder that there are some things that God is just going to do, and the wisest thing that we can do is cooperate with the providential will of God Someone please say amen. Sometimes that's just all you can do. You can just cooperate with God's will because it is going to be done. But on the other hand, we're shown this principle which says that one of the primary tools that God is going to use in your life to guide you and to help you understand God's will is the counsel of other people. And here's why. Many times we are forced to make decisions about things that are so close to us that we cannot be objective on our own, right? We're asked to make decisions about relationships, and with relationships there is always emotion, and emotion always has a tendency to cloud our reason and our decision-making ability. For example, if you've ever been in love, you know what I'm talking about? Not love, not like you're married. I'm talking about love, okay? You know, I know, we know that people who are in love sometimes make silly, crazy, bad decisions, don't they? Amen, yes, okay. If you, here's another, if you've ever had to make decisions that deal with family members, you know how complicated those decisions can be. Sometimes we're asked to make decisions that are just over our head in terms of experience, knowledge, and information. So God has given us a resource. He's made it simple. He, you, me. Wait, 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 I'm not done. And he's given me, you. Do you see? He's given us one another. And just as no member of my physical body has been left to operate independently from the other parts, we have not been left to make decisions independently either. God has given us, thank God, one another in order to facilitate the decision-making process in our life. Now this morning, I'm going to give you some, some guidelines to help you create this category in your thinking where you're willing to say, God... I believe that you could speak to me through the people you have placed in and around me in my life. But before I do that, let me, let me explain why this is so important to me as a pastor. I've spent 29 years in ministry talking to all kinds of people, dealing with all kinds of situations over and over and over again as I've listened to someone share their story of their situation or of the mess that their life has become as sensitively as I know how, and you guys would all agree, sensitivity is one of my spiritual gifts, as sensitively as I know how, I have always tried to ask this question. Did you ask anybody about this? Okay, if you, if you have been in counseling with me, if you've had a conversation with me, you may remember me asking you, have you asked anybody about this? Before you sign the deal, 
Did you run this by anybody? Before you got in the middle of this thing, did you have anybody look over it? Before you married her and got into this and that, did you talk to anybody else? And almost 100% of the time, do you know what the answer is? Well, no. No. And I'm thinking to myself, this is what I'm thinking. I'm giving you free behind-the-scenes footage here. Okay, I'm thinking to myself, somebody with an average IQ and just a little bit of objectivity would have been able to look at that situation from the outside and they would have said to you, hey, bad decision. Okay, bad decision. Now, I think it's funny, I think it's interesting that when I ask specifically Christians about this, do you know what they have a tendency to say? It's always the same. No, but I've prayed about it right? Oh, no, I didn't ask, but I've, I've prayed about it. And you know what? I don't mean to make light of praying, because praying about a decision is 100% essential. But hear me, it is not the only resource that God has given us to help us make sound decisions. Because in about 90% of the situations where people get into these terrible messes, if they had just invited in just the least bit of wise counsel, they could have completely avoided the mess that they are in. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, Justin, that's all good, but now I'd like to stand up and tell my side of the story, okay, on this whole asking people for advice thing. I had this friend who counseled me to start this business or or to get in on this investment, and it was the worst decision I've ever made in my life, right? Because most of us have, at some point, gotten bad advice from people we trusted, yes? In fact, just go ahead and point to somebody who's given you bad advice in your life. No, I'm kidding. Don't do that. If you think about it, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, got some very bad advice. And the end of that story is that the kingdom of Israel was split in two. So here's what I need you to know. Hear me. Soak this in. This is important. All advice is not good advice. Do you agree with that? Why don't you say it with me? Let's say it together. Ready? All advice is is not good advice. So, so we need to learn to listen carefully and we need to establish some boundaries and some parameters about who we listen to and how we listen to them. And so I'm going to finish up this morning by, just, by being just as practical as I possibly can. I want you to walk out of here today with four or five things that maybe you can discuss over lunch and know that this stuff will work if I put it into practice in my life. Let's start with this, choosing the right people, okay? Choosing the right people. Number one, choose people who have nothing to lose by telling you the truth, all right? Write that in, double underline it. You may be saying, I think I've heard you say this before. Yes, you have, and you will again. Choose people who have nothing to lose by telling you the truth. Here's the problem for Rehoboam. His friends had a lot to lose depending on the decision that he made. Right? Now, all of us in this room have friends like that. They're more concerned about your friendship than they are about you as a friend. In other words, they would be willing to to tell you whatever they need to tell you to make sure that nothing happens to that relationship, even if it's not the right decision for you. You need to find somebody who has nothing to lose by telling you the truth. Here's number two. Choose people who are where you want to be in life spiritually. Okay? I'm telling you, write that down. Choose people who are where you want to be in life spiritually. I'm talking about people who spiritually have made a habit out of following God's direction in order to get where they are. I'm talking about people who you can look at and say, I want to be where you are in your marriage. I want to have the kind of financial peace and priorities that you have. I'd like to be where you are as a godly businessman or woman. 
And, and understand, I'm not saying you have a perfect marriage or that you've made perfect financial decisions or that all your family relationships are flawless. But when I look at you, I realize I'm not where you are, and I think you'd be a pretty good model for me to follow. Does that sound right? Does that make sense? Now, the problem is that too often we ask people for advice who are no farther down the road than we are. Do you know what I'm talking about? You know, you're having some marital problems, and a guy walks past your office, and you're like, hey, hey, come in here and, and, and sit down. And he sits down, and the deal is, he's as dumb as you are. Yeah. And you're like, you know, hey, let, let me, you know, my wife, yada, 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 and, and, and here's what's going on. And, and he says to you, well, I'll, you know, this is what people, I'll tell you what I'd do. And you listen, and you're like, hey, hey, that, uh, that's exactly right. And he's got no business giving advice. And you've got no business taking it from him, okay? It's a bad situation. Because, see, we don't really have any business asking advice from people who aren't any further along in their maturity or their experience than we are. I mean, look, I'm not putting them down. They're peers. They're friends. They may be wonderful people. Let's share. Let's talk. Let's pray together. But when it comes to counsel and saying, God, I want you to speak to me, listen, we got to be so careful. And chances are that the bad advice that you've gotten, even from professional counselors, came from men and women who may have been a little bit older and a little bit more educated, but in terms of being where you want to be spiritually, they were no closer than where you are. Okay? You see, what Rehoboam did right in this story was he went to the men who had been there and had done that, and he said, hey, having watched you uh, having watched you support a king and see how that king operated for 40 years, what do you think I ought to do? And can we agree they gave him good advice? Did Rehoboam have any experience in leading people? No. Did his young friends have any experience in leading people? No. They were no further along in that than he was, and that is why their advice lacked perspective. And so, when you're looking for wise, godly counsel, you need to look for people who have nothing to lose by telling you the truth. And you need to look for counselors who are where you want to be spiritually. All right, then let me give you a couple of questions to ask. All right, this is after you've explained your situation and your circumstances and your best understanding of what's going on. And then you ask these two things. Are you ready? This is really, listen, this will save me so much time counseling you, okay? Just, I can't believe, you can't believe how much better my sermons will be after this. Number one question. Are any of the options I'm considering outside the boundaries of Scripture? And I mean, here's the deal, you know, like, Turn the cameras off. Everybody, you know, put your church glasses aside. We all know we hate that question, right? I mean, we hate it. We're like, oh, I'm done. I'm out. Question one, I'm finished. I don't need that in my life. I got enough problems. I am not following that. This is a serious question, guys. A lot of the regrets that are represented in this room, and we're not going to do this ever, But I could ask you to raise your hand and each one stand up and tell us about your deepest, darkest regret in life. Do you understand that many, most of our deepest, darkest regrets would have been solved if we had simply asked this one question? Are any of the options I'm considering outside the boundaries of Scripture? As far as you know, you're asking this person, am I trying to circumvent God's moral will with any of the options that I'm considering? Now, this is especially good for new Christians or Christians who don't yet have a ton of biblical knowledge because, you know, we've all got to start somewhere, but you really want to do the right thing. Is there anything that is outside of Scripture in what I'm considering? Here's the second question. You've got to narrow it down just a little bit, okay? Number two, what do you think is the wise thing for me to do? 
What is the wise thing for me to do? See, a lot of times the issues that we're dealing with are not right or wrong issues. They're not moral issues. Do we stay in Oklahoma City or do we move to Tulsa is not a moral issue. And so the wisdom question focuses in, based on what you know about me, based on what you know about God, based on the way that you know the world works, what do you think the wise thing is for me to do? And the Bible says, Proverbs 28, 26, he who trusts in his own heart is a, fill in, what is it? A fool. Who, who trusts in his own heart is a fool, but he who walks wisely will be delivered. Proverbs 12, 15 says the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. By the way, guess who wrote both of those verses? Solomon, Rehoboam's father. But see, through wisdom, God delivers us from an awful lot of bad decisions. And if you'll be selective in who you ask, and if you'll be strategic in the questions you ask, you'll be amazed at how many times God will use the body of Christ to give you guidance and to give you solid direction. Now, there are, we like to be practical here at OBC, correct? I mean, we, 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 like, the, we like the knowledge stuff, we like to understand, but we also like to be practical. There are two reasons why we won't do this, okay? I mean, I'm, I'm very practical about you people and your willingness to be obedient, okay? I'm not a fool. I understand. Here's two reasons why we won't do this. Why won't we do this? Men, you know why we won't do it. Same reason we'll drive around lost and then go faster, right? We're like, I'm, we're almost there to where I don't know, but we'll, we'll get there faster. The reason we don't do this, first of all, is pride, Pride, is it okay for me as your pastor to just admit that to you? That sometimes I don't do the very thing I'm teaching you and preaching to you because of my pride. You know, because I should be able to figure this out and I don't need anybody telling me what to do. Does that sound familiar? You have a voice in your head that speaks that? Yeah, same voice in my head, okay? Men especially, let me set you free. Great leadership is not about making decisions on your own. It's about owning the decisions that you've made. And it's about, as Christians, taking advantage of every relationship and every resource offered to us by God. There's a second reason that we avoid this principle. It's because we already know what they're going to say, and we don't want to hear it. Amen? When we're asking for advice from a godly, wise counselor, we already know what they're going to say, and we don't want to hear it. Do you ever have that in your life? I do. I don't want to ask him because I already know what he is going to say. Never mind if it's biblical. Never mind if it's wise. Never mind if he's more you know, mature spiritually than I'll ever dream of being. That thing he's going to say that I need to do, I don't want to do it. Okay? Listen, when you find yourself avoiding counsel because you don't want to hear what you think you're going to hear, that should be a big red flag that says, you better slow down. You better slow down. You may not be ready to make this decision. Now, I mentioned earlier that we do crazy things when we're in love, right? Well, it makes me think of something stupid that I once did when I was in love. Christine and I had been dating for about six months. Now, normally I have to have approval before I mention Christine's name. And I didn't, in this case, because this is, there's no exaggeration, okay? Not that I would ever do that, but there's, there, this is the total, 100%, straight down the line truth, okay? And Christine can confirm that for you after the service is over, all right? <laughs> Someone suggested it was not wise, okay? I'm doing the preaching here, okay? Okay. Christine and I had been dating for about six months, which was about four months longer than I'd ever dated anyone before, okay? 
It was the summer before our senior year. We were high school sweethearts. I was starting to get the feeling that this relationship could go somewhere. And to be honest, that kind of scared me. I was having all of these doubts about whether I had any business in a serious relationship because quite honestly, I'd never really had a serious relationship before. Actually, I thought they were all serious, you know, for like four weeks, okay? And, and, and so I, I was, and, and I'll be honest, I was also, you know, you have that thought in your mind, this is also not wise, but you have that thought, you know, what if there are other fish in the sea, right? All that that goes on. And rather than talking to Christine about it, I just kept it to myself. And I just kept, I, I, I prayed. I mean, I really did. I was praying. And, and I didn't like what I was feeling as I prayed. And I already knew what Christine would say. And by the time we were ready to start school, I was a complete mess. Okay? I was just a mess. And so I went over to her house one night. And, and we're sitting on the porch swing together. And I finally decided to seek some godly counsel. I said, Christine, how would you feel if we broke up? And you know what she said? She didn't say anything. She started crying hysterically. Now, I'm so glad you guys find this so funny. It, it took a, a, a few days or maybe a couple of weeks, I can't exactly remember, for her to forgive me for saying that. But let me tell you something that happened. In that moment when she broke down and started crying, and I could see her heart breaking, that was the moment when I realized how much I loved her. That was the moment that I realized just how much she meant in my life and how much of a gift God had given me in her. Now, in May, Christine and I will have been married for 26 years. But I think back to that time and I realize what an incredible mistake I could have made in my life. Do you see it? And how different my life would be now And all because I wasn't taking advantage of the resources God had given me to help me make my decisions. Listen, God has given us one another. And he's willing to speak through the people he's put around us. If we will learn to leverage this principle, if we'll be careful about who we go to, and if we'll ask the right questions. And so my question for you this morning is, are you willing to say to God, God, I am ready to accept the fact that you have put people in my life who can help me discern your will and make decisions that are pleasing to you? God, I'm going to swallow my pride. I'm going to trust in you. And I'm going to leverage every resource you've made available to me. And here's the deal you will be amazed at how God will provide godly counsel if you'll ask for it and seek it out. Because remember, your Father in heaven wants you to know his will even more than you do. Will you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, We recognize, again, this is just not something that we're very good at. This thing where we swallow our pride, this thing where we seek out advice that we know we don't want to hear, this thing where we we trust in all of the resources you've put in our life, that this is hard for many of us to do. So God, I pray that first of all, you would help what we've learned from your word today to sink into our mind and into our heart that we may understand it, that we may get it. We get the principle. We need one another, that you speak to us through one another. And we need to be very careful about who we seek advice from. God, help us understand it. But then, God, help us take another step 
that next step that says, not only do I understand it, I'm going to apply it in my life. And from today forward in my life, God, never again am I going to make a decision without praying, seeking your will, seeking knowledge from your word, and seeking godly counsel from the people that you've put around me in my life who are where I want to be spiritually someday. Father, I pray for somebody here this morning. They may be here for the first time. Maybe things going on in the world around us prompted them to come and want to be here and and feel something or learn something that would make them feel better. God, there may be somebody here this morning who just very simply, they don't know you. They know about you. Maybe they, they have a Bible. Maybe they've read that Bible. Maybe they've been to church, but they don't know you in a saving way. They haven't put their trust in you. God, I pray that you will just just show them that placing their trust in Jesus as their Savior is the most important decision they could ever make. And God, it will change their life forever. God, could something we've learned today change our life forever? This is our prayer. Will you help us, God? In Jesus' name I pray.